Welcome to the Doomer Optimism Podcast. Uh, I am joined today by James Pogue, who is the author of this book, Chosen Country, or Rebellion in the West, and um, has written articles in Harper's and Vanity Fair and uh, New York Times Magazine, um, among other places. Uh, but more importantly, he's from Southwest Ohio. And uh, <clears throat> a background that he and I both share. Um, we knew each other a little bit as teenagers, and it's been interesting to follow his writing career. And he's now uh, a resident of Northern California and has been over the last, I don't know how many years, a chronicler of, um, of the peculiarities of rural America, but not in the uh, annoying way that you would think a writer for the New York Times Magazine uh, is. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, his life and uh, about some things he's chronicled and then about what he's been doing and writing about more recently about forests in, um, in the American West. But we're going to start off talking about the place in the world that really matters, which is Southwest Ohio. So James, paint us a picture of growing up in Cincinnati and particularly about uh, the woods behind your house <laughs> that you write about in your book and to set the stage uh, for everything that comes after. Okay, <clears throat> so um, first point would be that I grew up for the first 11 years of my life as the only white kid in a black neighborhood called Mount Auburn uh, in central Cincinnati. Uh, neighborhood of, you know, very classic Midwestern neighborhood of like big houses, sort of dilapidated white flight. Um, but it was the original Cincinnati suburb. So William Howard Taft lived there and was born there. Um, actually, my aunt was weirdly born in William Howard Taft's second, first house. And then his second major mansion I went to high school in, which was the School for Creative Performing Arts, which Don, you obviously know. Um, then I moved and Taft is the president suburb. with the giant bathtub. Well, he was giant. The bathtub was small, right? So oh, he right. This is the main thing I remember about being taught in school <laughs> was about the bathtub of William Howard Taft. Okay, continue. Um, and so I moved out to the suburbs. Uh, I kind of like you know early junior high or something like that era, um, or the the exact edge of Cincinnati, the exact border between the suburbs and the city. And what's interesting about the eastern fringes of Cincinnati is sort of both culturally and literally legally, the border of Appalachia starts at the Hamilton County, Claremont County line. Um, and so right there where we were living, you kind of bleed from this kind of dowdy, traditional Cincinnati, yeah, I often in my own pieces describe it as like brass button, blue blazer kind of east side of Cincinnati thing that was a very mercantile um, old school American upper middle class uh, with the kind of like rampaging redneck hordes that surround Cincinnati on at least two sides from Kentucky and I guess three actually from Kentucky, the eastern fringes of Appalachia, uh, the western sort of more German Indiana kind of um, trending suburbs. And so all of a sudden, I was in this kind of like funny cross cultural current of uh, not to use a dangerous term, but of, of sort of white cultural intermingling um, of these kind of American tribal strands that, you know, uh, we talk about, you know, you talk a lot about the Germans in Cincinnati. Um, the east side of Cincinnati has a huge number of Appalachians um, in this neighborhood that is called the East End. Um, and so my dad went to AA in the East End, you know, and there's again, this kind of very countrified feel to a place that would seem much more urban from afar uh, probably than it actually is. Um, and so you have these kind of row houses along the river that look quite genteel, but are filled with rundown um, kind of multi-generational houses uh, it's the camels at the AA meeting. It's everybody's name, you know, Snake Man Bill and Hubcap Bob and stuff like that. Um, and so I don't know about you, Don, but I felt to some degree like it was the kind of, it was kind of like the last fringe of, and like a kind of like almost like a railroad nexus of like the various American settler white tribes that kind of arrived in 
on, on the Eastern seaboard and then migrated out to the West and kind of became dispersed into this kind of like big amorphous mass, right? Um, and Cincinnati felt to me like the last fringe of a place where you could still kind of identify with those weird strands of people who crossed the Cumberland Gap and did all of that good old stuff that used to be the kind of substance of folk song and ballad, you know? Um, why am I talking about that? Because it, it bears a lot in mind in terms of like what happened later in American politics and it shaped a lot of like of my sense of myself as a writer because that is territory that a lot of people in the sort of liberal media sphere find very dangerous to talk about and find it very sort of like, you're, you're almost like verging on right-wing fascist stuff, but even by acknowledging and noticing that those strands exist in American history at this point. Um, and I have just played a different game where I actually kind of like openly own that stuff and, and view it as something that's worth talking about because it's just gonna shape our politics whether you like it or not. Um, to get beyond that to the woods, um, I also happen to have the luck to have 500 acres of woods that we did not own behind our house. Uh, and those connected to a city park, which connected to a little Miami River trailway, which, so basically there was somehow, you could get to about 10,000 acres of unused space that was, for lack of a better term, like basically unpoliced uh, in a way that like an urban kid growing up in America today, like would just, I, it would be very, very difficult to find and recreate except in some of these Midwestern spaces where there's a lot of like sort of unused land and there's a lot of sort of like, forgotten parcels and things like that. Um, and so I was able to move through that space. I wasn't really allowed a lot of screen time. I was, so I kind of like, my video games were just like taking sticks and bashing other sticks with them. Like up until like a kind of nerdy age, like 15, 16, like, like time when you like playing with fake swords, like probably isn't that cool. Um, but it was because you could move unobserved throughout vast spaces. Um, and that's something that, again like I've always like really liked about the west too is it's like I can drive 10 minutes in any direction from my house right now and know that whatever I do is not going to be seen by another human uh and that, that's an experience that I actually think a lot of people don't have often anymore um and it's an experience that I think can be quite formative and, and in fact like quite addictive like it's like it's once you get used to having that be three or four hours of your day where you can scream to the wind and no one can hear you. Like, it's hard to go back to not being able to have that. Um, and that was why I think that was, to, it was my great luck to have sort of like left New York as a young-ish and moderately successful journalist and just be like, I would rather not have a career than stay here. Um, and that ended up probably helping my career in the long run. Uh, but it was also like socially painful. It was career-wise, it, it, I do think it like slowed me down in certain ways. I wasn't going to those parties. I wasn't meeting the same people. Um, but it allowed me to kind of do this other thing and write about things that frankly were more interesting and closer to, I think, the beating heart of our politics and environment than anything you could even touch in New York, you, anything you could even be aware of in New York at this point. Um, Cause there's so many things that are cut off from the discussion. Uh, so that was Woods, that was Southwestern Ohio. Um, so your book is nominally about your time in uh, at the infamous Bundy um, occupation. Um, but it's really a book about you coming of age and falling in love with the West, the American West. Um, but even before you uh, started writing about it, I'm going to pause actually and let your computer resolve again. Okay. Yep. Shout out to whoever's editing this again. All right. Before okay. you started writing about the Bundy thing, um, you talk about just taking trips, just living out of the back of your truck, traveling around the West. Um, and, uh, and particularly about exploring. Um, the section of the American West, the Great Basin. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that region a bit. It's 
sparsely populated, hard to make a living there um, because of vegetation and uh, lack of water and things. So talk, talk a little bit of the Great Basin. Where is it? Uh, what are its borders? And um, what, kind of, what kind of land is it? What kind of people live there? Um, so yeah, I mean, like you said, I was not, I'm not, and I would never claim to be, I was not one of these like sort of Western hands, like a lot of people were. I wasn't going to Montana. I wasn't fly fishing. I didn't start shooting guns till my mid twenties. Um, I mean, I had shotguns. I wasn't, a, I wasn't like a city boy, but these, it wasn't, I didn't own guns certainly until my twenties. I didn't personally own a fly rod until my 20s. Like, so a lot of the ways that people explore that interior West were actually alien to me. Um, and the first way I did it was by train hopping, which you may well have done yourself. Um, no, I and, never did it. I never did it. Well, there's still time. I, um, uh, but so, you know, I would travel through and, it, and, you know, to an Easterner, it's a very alien landscape. If you go, you can go anywhere from the Florida Panhandle to, Panhandle to Maine and see things that feel familiar to you, feel, be in a part of ecosystems that feel basically like they work in similar ways. And then you get out uh, basically across the front range um, into the interior west and everything starts to reverse, like the, the rainfall patterns, what you expect to happen in the summer, everything is different. Um, and, you know, Ed Abbey has a thing about, about the Great Basin actually where, um, he's talking to a rancher and he asks what the guy likes about the desert and he says it's clean um and i felt that very strongly i feel that about california i like the i like the aridity i like the cleanliness of it um but the great basin is ecologically speaking um what you call an endorheic drainage basin and it's a set of interconnected basins that essentially all drain to a flat saline valley essentially rather than to flowing to rivers that will then flow to all the rivers that will then get to the coast right um and so when we literally say the great basin um what we mean is that it is a part of that series of various other basins that are not allowing their water to escape to the coast um what we mean ecologically is that it is the area of the united states dominated by great basin sagebrush artemisia tridentata um and, you know, it, it's, again, it's like this kind of desert that doesn't quite look like desert to a lot of people. Um, and so a lot of people who, you know, sort of look at uh, what would the other three deserts in the North America, which are creosote brush dominated, look much more sort of arid, the Mojave, the Sonoran Desert with their, you know, kind of cacti and things. Um, the Great Basin is a colder desert and it's a much lusher desert. It gets more high, le high level snowfall. Um, it has, a, I mean, a significantly larger population of ungulates and large fauna uh, like elk and mule deer and things like that. Um, but it is still a kind of pretty blasted place. Um, and it's still like everywhere in the arid West, a place where if you are going to make a living, control of water uh, is going to be the first thing. Um, and that in large part is, you know, it's like anywhere in the West, it's first in time, first in right. Uh, the first people who came to the Great Basin for, throughout much of it were Mormons. Uh, and so much of it, much of the economic base, if not the population base, even outside of Utah in um, the Great Basin is going to be Mormon dominated. And that's as true in Southern Idaho um, as it is in agricultural communities in Nevada and everywhere else. Um, and what's interesting about it <laughs> is that it's a place where ranching persists very much as a lifestyle, if you want to call it that, um, as a, in a way, I, I guess I want to specify something. It persists as a way of life that even normal people engage in, um, in a way that is a little bit less true of somewhere like a lot of Montana, Wyoming today. Um, where you really have to want to do it. You really, really have to be extremely well capitalized um, and where small ranching is to some degree an anachronism. Uh, that is probably true in the Great Basin, but much less so. Um, and that again has a lot to do with Mormon communities having a huge amount of social cohesion, a huge amount of tenacity in terms of like trying to preserve their 
if you want to call it way of life, um, their historical modes of doing things. Um, you also have throughout much of this world, like a literal different urban structure, because um, unlike in most of rural America, people in the Great Basin tend to live in centralized towns and then have their fields outside, which is a long time Mormon settlement pattern. Um, it's very different than like Kentucky or even Montana, where you're going to have house, house, house surrounded by large amounts of fields. Um, and that in its own way creates a huge amount of social cohesion. Um, it also creates a huge amount of, uh, not to go into this necessarily, but social problems, because you are going to be observed. Your, your activities are known in a lot of these small towns to everybody involved in a way that is almost unimaginable to people who are not necessarily a part of this world. Um, and it's a very overwhelming, like if you live in Manti, Utah, you are known, everything you have done for all of your life is known to pretty much everybody else in the town. And that's a kind of experience of living in America that I think almost no people today have anymore. Um, and it's a very strange kind of way of living uh, to, at least to my mind, where again, having grown up prizing not being observed. Um, so in terms of the book, um, there are a lot of different strands of how Mormonism interacts with the land. Um, and there are a lot of different strands of like how Mormonism gets involved in politics. Um, and certainly there's no way to characterize the Mormon church in general as a single body with a single set of views. Uh, but I wrote a book about the Bundys uh, who we don't really have to talk to about that much. There's a lot written about them. Um, but they are kind of a part of a ferment in this area that it very much blends a strand of like very intense Mormon fundamentalism. Um, I'm sort of misusing that word because Mormon fundamentalism tends to mean that you still believe in polygamy. But I mean, there's another strand of hardline Mormonism that views the constitution as essentially a sacred document and that uh, essentially views the federal government according to some reading of it, and that's a long story, but according to certain readings, the constitution barring the federal government from owning land, and in the Great Basin, um, you know, Nevada, you have upwards of 80% of the land is owned by the federal government, uh, Utah, it's going to be upward of 60, uh, in eastern Oregon, eastern Washington, I don't know the exact figures, but a lot of counties are going to be like 90 plus, um, and so there's a lot of discussion about this area as a sort of cradle of anti-government sentiment. Uh, the truth I think is much more complicated. Uh, I think Mormons have adopted in certain ways this reading the constitution because they tend often on this harder line side of things to feel like the federal government has been co-opted by environmentalists and by essentially like hikers from Boston who wanna get rid of them and their way of life so that they can have pristine sort of preservationist tendencies adopted across this land. Uh, and the result has been like a big confusing stew uh, because frequently people don't understand the motivations involved here. Um, and frequently uh, the people who are on the more sort of ferment or if you wanna call it anti-government side kind of color the government is universally evil instead of the subject to a lot of lobbies and tendencies that really these bureaucrats don't have that much control over. Um, and the result has been basically stasis. And we can talk about that, but it's a bad scene because there's a there's very, very serious problems here that don't exist anywhere in the world, uh, having largely to do with sagebrush ecosystems. And if I'm being candid, I'm not sure that we're gonna get around to fixing them before it's too late. Um, so yeah, it's 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 it gets it's getting to a point where things are going to get probably pretty ugly. So let's put aside politics for a second. When did you first fall in love with sagebrush? <laughs> um, actually, uh, not in technically the Great Basin, or actually, you know, technically in the Great Basin. I was living in LA, and I didn't like it very much. Um, I move around a lot, and I had this like old red Ford Ranger. Um that I would like sleep out of the back of. And I was uh, living with prisoner crews, like prisoner wildfire crews on the big rim fire in California. Um, and the rough contours of the Great Basin are basically 
you know, you have the, the um, Rocky Mountains on the east edge, and then you have the Sierra Nevada and the Cascades on the west. Um, and I was living up on the Rim Fire, this is 2014, and I crossed over into the Owens Valley, which I had never been to. And the Owens Valley is unique ecologically in that it's the only place in the world where creosote, um, creosote desert blends with sagebrush desert. Um, and it's the westernmost endorheic valley of this Great Basin. Um, and I just thought, I just think it's beautiful. I just like the color blue green, to be honest. Um, and like the Sierra Lakes are blue green because of the glacial rock flower. And then you're sort of like seeing, and then they're coming out of those lakes down into this basin and they have that blue green. And then the sagebrush is there. And then it, like it, it's so fragrant and astringent. And it just, again, it like feels clean. It feels right. Like, it, and you can, anyone who spends a lot of time around any kind of, um, any kind of Artemisia or any kind of sagebrush, um, anything in that genus, knows that they kind of they're highly aromatic and they they kind of communicate via aerosols um as much as you know plants do underground as well through mycorrhizae and stuff uh so like at moments of disturbance or weather change like a whole place will suddenly become very aromatic and it, it, it's really difficult i think if you spend a lot of time around these ecosystems not to notice um how alive they are um maybe that's not the word but how communicative and responsive they are in a way that maybe is less present in a creosote desert, to me at least, personally. Um, and so I got involved with growing California native plants in LA and I wasn't that good at it at the time. Um, but over the years, uh, I actually, I came to run a native plant nursery in LA for several years and doing restoration work there. Um, I didn't really get to grow basin sagebrush because it just doesn't grow in LA except at high elevations, very high elevations. Um, but the Artemisia, like that genus just sort of like became my like specialty world. Um, and I, I don't know, I've probably grown 35 species of it at this point. Um, and I don't know about other nursery people or gardeners, or maybe they have their own genuses that they really like. It just this one is mine, and I can I can now I can spot them. Like I'll see new species and just be like, oh, huh, um, in a way that I probably couldn't do for a lot of other plants. So there's some connection there. I don't know what it is. When did you realize that you wanted to settle in the West and stick around? <laughs> I to be honest, I actually don't know that I have. Uh, this is this is something I really wrestle with. I have never come around to feeling like this place isn't weird. And I think that's kind of why I like it. Like, like it, like I, I look out my window right now. Um, it's May 9th. I'm at 2000 feet elevation. It's 38 degrees and snowing. Uh, I'm in California. Uh, why is that happening? Uh, it's just, and then I can look and I can see Mount Shasta. It's 14,000 feet high. It's happening because there's a snowstorm at the top of Mount Shasta and there's like downslope winds that are coming. Stuff like that doesn't happen in the East. Like just, there's, there's something so weird. And then like the fact that after this precipitation, obviously no one knows, but after this precipitation, we may not get precipitation again until October. And like everything that I'm seeing around me right now, blooming and lush, and it's just gonna be, dead by or dead isn't the right word but isn't gonna be brown and disappearing um by october i've never gotten used to that and i've never felt like it was natural to me um and in a weird way like that's what's so delicious about it because it's like i still approach like everything with wonder like i still think it's just like like the rivers here are so nutrient poor that um, to quote uh, a book I like, um, The Klamath Knot, the rivers here are so nutrient poor that the Salmonids decide to leave them and go to the ocean and eat shrimps and stuff and then die by their thousands on their way back to here in the ultimate vote of, quote, no confidence in the nutrient potential of these rivers. That still blows my mind. 
I still think that that's like an incredibly insane thing that they developed uh, to solve a problem that just seems alien to me because to me and you presumably, you think of rivers as being so nutrient rich that they almost choke off, right? Um, and so I don't know, I just find that wonderful. And I think that that's why I can still write about it is like, I'm interested in stuff that feels actually very distant from my shaping experience. So I live in a city of I don't know, 80,000 in Pacific Northwest, Northwest Washington. And there's a, a creek that runs right by downtown and we watch salmon run. Everyone yeah. just goes on the bridge and we just watch salmon run. They're going up the rocks and it never, the seals hang out and <laughs> have a salmon buffet. And it, um, until you've seen it, it's really, it's one yeah. thing to like know so on some level, this is what salmon do, you know, and they go and they find gravel and they lay their eggs, but to actually see it. And even the tiny creek over by my house, we've never seen live salmon, but we know salmon run there. We've seen dead salmon. Uh, so I really hope to see live salmon. It's small. It's a real small, especially uh, in the summer, it gets real small. But um, until you've seen salmon run, it's just unreal. And then to think that even now what I'm seeing is just a small portion of what it, of what it once was. Just tiny, just tiny, right? The Chinook you have to go up to Alaska to get some yeah. glimpse of, yeah, of uh, uh, what it what it used to be. Um, I mean, you you used to be able to walk. I mean, this is the joke. You used to be able to walk across the LA River on the backs of the steelhead, and the southern steelhead were never that numerous compared to up. I mean, compared to these higher north rivers, and um. This is just a little aside, but uh, I'll, I will tell you because it's pretty fun. Um, I've had this long, the, the place where I do feel the most like sort of naturally plugged in is oddly LA. Like I really like, like I really understand the ecology of LA like, and I really understand kind of like, kind of how the infrastructure and, and ecology fit together. And I've spent a lot of time there um, and I've done a lot of restoration work there. Uh, and so there's this little tiny stream that runs at most like two or three CFS um, in a good spring, uh, aside from during runoff when it goes crazy. Uh, and we've been working to put rainbow genetics back in that stream. And everybody says, no, 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 it's not gonna be possible. It's not gonna be possible. It's too small. It's too hot. Um, and this is like real doomer optimism stuff for me at least is the California Department of Fish and Wildlife came over like Thanksgiving weekend and just put 300 rainbows in there. And then we had the worst, hottest, most horrible summer of my experience in LA. Uh, and a lot of those fish survived, like in very thin water, very poor oxygen levels, but they can adapt. And we found them like living in pools. You don't think a rainbow trout should be able to do this, but they were living in pools in the 80 degree temperature range and surviving. And that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, science says that doesn't. <laughs> science says that yeah, that's gone, but it, it's real. I've seen it. Um, so that's that's a little white pill for you if, if anybody wants one. So, what does restoration work look like in Los Angeles? I've well, spent a little bit of time in Los Angeles, and the last thing that comes to my mind with Los Angeles is environmental restoration but so yeah tell me about that well i mean we so la probably more than anywhere else um probably more than anywhere else in the united states like sort of like in the public facing landscape of the city has more or less for a period of time excised native plants from the kind of like botanical vernacular of the city, right? So you have all of these things that are, you, people associate um, with California, but particularly with Southern California that are like hakaranda trees, whether it's eucalyptus, whether it's all of the South African succulents, like the botanical vernacular, vernacular of LA is, is just basically just totally non-native, um, even more so than the Bay, I would say. And the Bay has a long, a much longer and older tradition of native plant stuff. Um, and hey, like as the long term, as a long term ecosystem, um, that's just not. It, you just actually can't do that. Like, uh, like our bees, uh, our bees are all disappearing. Um, and I don't mean honeybees. I mean like 
our native Southern California digger bees, which are mostly solitary uh, and which for a while were very rare. Um, and like the parks for a long time did not have native plants. Um, and now obviously that has very much changed um, for, which to go on a little bit of a side, like it's really funny because after kind of winning the argument about bringing native plants back into the botanical vernacular in American life, you saw this kind of funny backlash where it was like, maybe native plants are actually blood and soil and fascism. And I, 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 that was where I started actually getting on Twitter because I was like, I started seeing those pieces and I was like, this is insane. Um, uh, but so basically like what I was involved in, I was working on a native plant nursery in um, Pasadena uh, that was a long time kind of watershed restoration. So it was basically like we would, we looked at this very hyper local specific watershed, which was not even the LA River. It was a 41 mile Creek tributary to the LA. Um, so we're talking hyper, hyper, hyper local genetics. And the idea was to procure those genetics, reproduce those, and then have them going into people's yards, essentially, and going into park restoration, creek restoration. So we would have a tributary to our little creek where the city of Pasadena came through and got rid of a bunch of invasives, got rid of an old bridge, I think, got rid of a culvert. And then you have to put 10,000 plants in there. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal for coyotes and bobcats and everything down to those bees. That really changes the composition of a neighborhood in terms of ecosystem stuff. Um, and then we had a huge like multi-billion dollar project to remove sediment from behind a big dam um, right near the Rose Bowl. And so you're talking again, tens of thousands of plants um, that I tried to deliver. To be honest, I learned a lot about my inability to deliver tens of thousands of plants um, and how overwhelming a volunteer run nursery um, can be when you're trying to do things at that scale. Uh, now I think I would do it a lot better, uh, but it was, a it was a lesson in biting off more than you can chew. That project is still ongoing though, and we're still doing it in, with the same approach. Um, and it, you know, it's gonna work out because essentially we sued them and won. So they had to play ball and they had to kind of adopt our plan for what should be done to mitigate what they screwed up with their dam. Um, and so there's gonna be thousands of willows, cottonwoods, the stuff that, you know, would exist anywhere in the West. It's just, those are coming from right where we are instead of from places many, many miles away where they might not do as well. So how do you end up in Northern California? Um, and I should say to preface this question that James wrote recently for Harper's Magazine, very interesting essay about a section of Northern California that some of its residents uh, have for decades now called the state of Jefferson. Is it not just California actually going up into Oregon and um, a uh, kind of independence movement to, to create a, a state of its own. And if you, you have an image in your mind of what California is like, like is read this article because it's a different, you know, California is multiple worlds, you know, Central Valley versus LA versus, but then this is, uh, this part of Northern California is its own animal entirely. And so, and you've, you've uh, end up living there. Or I think that you're still living there. So if you could talk a little bit about um, this part of California, and you can talk about the state of Jefferson stuff if you'd like, but uh, uh, I'm kind of curious more about the um, the ecology of the place. Um, yeah. yeah. Than the politics. So we, I mean, the the two are interconnected. But anyway. So, yeah, the the two are very interconnected. Um, and uh, for people who don't know this region, um, I think, the, but who know a little bit about ecology in general, um, you could understand this as kind of, it is a natural, when you talk about the state of Jefferson as a separate place, this is a natural division. This is, it kind of, we, we kind of start at one line over um, on the east at the border between the Southern Cascades and the, um, the Northern uh, end of the Sierra Nevada. Um, and so there's like a kind of 
brief hop, skip, and a jump from Sierra County, Downeyville, that area that people are often very familiar with because they've seen Yosemite. They know those weather patterns. They know those big storms that are coming in, dumping. Um, and then you get to this other kind of broken chain of volcanoes that starts shaping the eastern fringe of this region. Um, you get to the Lost Coast on the west, the Humboldts, um, the Redwoods, uh, the rainforests um, that extend to some degree uh, all the way up to where you are, I guess. Um, not the Redwoods, but similar, similar ecology. I'm not that familiar with um, coastal Washington. But, um, and then you get the Siskiyous. Uh, and this is like kind of the cradle of American timber. Uh, we have pretty high growth rates. It's not, you know, it's not wet Oregon, but it's, we have pretty high growth rates in arid forests. Um, and we have, it's kind of, we have kind of, I'm trying to, I'm trying to characterize a very ecologically diverse region. Um, we have kind of an ecosystem that to a casual observer would look closer to something like Montana than it would to the rest of California. Um, we have a lot of wide and big valley rivers. Uh, we have a lot of salmon streams. Uh, the, the Klamath is outside of the Columbia, the best salmon, historically the best salmon stream on the West Coast. Um, and it is historically like a major, like a huge, huge, huge corridor for um, native cultural and sort of um, fishing culture life uh, that has largely just been eviscerated. I mean, I fish the Klamath now I used to fish the Klamath actually. I won't fish it anymore because it's too bad and it's too, I'm not, I don't want to bang those fish up. Um, but we have, uh, you know, both Mount Shasta, Mount Lassen, um, and to some degree you could get farther up into Cascades of Oregon, um, where we have these huge, broad, grassy mountain valleys with lots of ungulates, at least compared to the rest of California. We have wolves here. Um, for the first time in probably a hundred years, uh, the first wolves to come to California um, are now, you know, doing killing sheep and out there and creating that wolf human rancher political wildfire conflict that um, really is going to get dangerous. Um, but above all, probably it is a forested region and it is kind of the cradle of American mega fires. Um, the Dixie fire, which I think is the largest fire in American history happened here last year, uh, just barely east of me. Uh, the car fire uh, was, I don't know, 300,000 acres in 2018. Um, and now has just been totally eclipsed. I mean, it doesn't, that doesn't even look like that bad of a fire anymore. Um, this is the region where the mega fire kind of got going. Um, and that gets into the politics because this is also uh, kind of one of the regions most impacted historically by what's known as the um, Northwest Forest Plan, uh, which arose from what's, what people probably remember as the Spotted Owl Crisis, uh, when the Spotted Owl was listed in 89, I think. Uh, and then we had a basically a complete shutdown of public lands logging in the West for years. And then we had a deal under the Clinton administration that was much ballyhooed about how you're gonna bring that back, but also preserve the spotted owl habitat. The long and complicated and unfortunate history is that actually public lands logging did not come back um, here. And uh, what's more, because of various laws, largely NEPA and ESA, you can't really do a lot on forests up here anymore. Um, there's a kind of confluence of regulatory factors that mean that even the Forest Service basically has their hands very much tied. And what that has meant is that there's really not a lot we can do to prevent the mega fires. You can't do large scale thinning. You can't, you certainly can't do large scale prescribed burns. Um, and so I just left I was sitting, I was sitting actually fishing and drinking with a burn boss on the Six Rivers Trinity um, forest uh, who lives out on the Klamath in a really small town called Orleans. Um, and it's kind of an interesting story that I'm working on right now because he's, he's a white guy from the Bay who moved up there and lives in a really small town with a lot of tension, frankly, between 
whites and natives. Uh, and then he has this pal who's a native guy from the Hoopa reservation, who's also a burn boss. Um, and it's kind of this like buddy comedy slash buddy tragedy because they're just, they're fighting this bureaucracy to try to basically like prevent these mega fires that burn up in the crowns and just destroy these forests and don't let them come back. And to be honest, they're, they're, I mean, they just talk in such, I mean, I can't wait to publish this piece, but it's such stark terms in ways that forest service guys usually don't because they'll risk getting fired and they're just like we don't fucking care we're going to talk this way to you and you can put it in the new york times or whatever you want to do um because what we're doing is a sham and this is going to be like an, an apocalypse here soon um and so, so let's it's talk about let's talk about forests and forest fires in the west and i um I think I mentioned earlier uh, in the podcast, like James and I knew each other a little bit as teenagers. We crossed paths. We had friends in common. And so when I was starting to see his name coming up, I shot him an email at some point so just to say hi. And also I saw he was working on some writing about forests in the West. And I had some questions because I, I don't live somewhere where we have fires, but we get a lot of smoke from fires. Mm. Uh, and so I was curious about that. Um, and so maybe we could go back in time a little bit yeah. about what forests were like mm -hmm. and about what fires were like before um, uh, the more, then we can get into the more recent history. I think the, the history of American forest management is a very sad one. Very. On multiple, le it's almost sad in every way, like <laughs> in both like, uh and sometimes i think about how amazing i was I, I met a guy at another dad at the playground recently who's um like a third generation he's worked in lumber in the northwest his family has for generations and it was neat to talk to him because of how well he knew the woods up here and the trees but you know he was just bemoaning the fact that the the earlier generations if they had logged better mm -hmm. and smarter how much how how well we'd be doing now yeah um but at the same time the stop not cutting down any trees has also been a huge created huge problems too and not as you said not allowing fire so anyway let's go back in time of what i don't know how far back you want to go you know but this subject a lot better than i do and to, the, a little bit I'll about the history of woods out in the west and fires and then um where things went wrong right so um okay actually i actually think i can do this pretty pretty concisely but we'll just do a hundred year capsule history of how this area got to this point um so first thing to know is and we can see this there there are photos of this so there, there's actually pretty good studies of this basically just the forest, if you're used to looking at forests in the West today, those forests are much more dense. There's a lot more trees today uh, than there historically were. Um, and that is kind of uncomfortable for a lot of people to acknowledge. I mean, we basically have a third, some places to, uh, up to a half, too many trees uh, compared to where they used to be. Um, on a lot of these forests. And um, that is in large part because of fire. Um, so is it that the trees used to be larger and more spread out? Or what do you mean? So yeah, talk a little bit about this, about the it, number it of trees, size of trees. What, it, what, what did one of these forests look like? It depends. So, you know, the old, the old kind of joke is that you should be able to drive a wagon through it, right? Um, and just to just to pick one species right one species would be that people are often pretty familiar with in the arid west probably less so where you are but to take the ponderosa pine right so ponderosa forests were kind of historically and you can see this in northern baja still uh you have these big 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 trees with large kind of golden in the, especially in summer where the grass has died off you have this golden grass in between you have a lot of light coming down through the canopy um, and that's only sustainable because you're having tons of fire coming through there. Because otherwise, all that light is just going to be there. Every one of those is going to be a seedling coming up and they're going to choke it. Right. And the problem that we have 
Well, actually, I'll wait for a second. So that persisted for a long time. Um, and that was in large part a human creation, not in all places, not at all times, uh, but it was in large part a human creation. Um, California is particularly like oak woodlands uh, with their wide open spaces uh, were very much, very much a product of, you know, the Yurok and the um, various tribes burning under those. Um, in other high montane areas, it's going to be lightning more so, you know, um, but like one of the things that I actually want to write about is you get this hand wringing, like even in like novels about LA, it's always like the smoke, the smoke showed how the ecology was breaking down. And it's like, no, actually we should be having smoke in our summers. Like if we're not having smoke in our summers, we have a big problem. Um, and people are gonna, you know, not to get real political, but one of the problems with liberalism today is like, if something harms some people, then you can't have it. So then we kind of end up in stasis, right? And there's a big problem in forestry because like you could have a whole town wiped out tomorrow. Like this town, if a fire comes through, no one is going to survive. I mean, we're at the top of a canyon, the fires can race up this canyon. Uh, but you can't really do a burn here because the smoke will come up the canyon and you have, you know, you have respiratory issues. And so how do you solve that? Our politics aren't really in a position to do that. Um, anyway, so- I, you Just an aside on that. I, I was talking to someone here and she was ex bemoaning the fact that because of, you know, because she said because of climate change and so on, all of these forests are going to be destroyed by fires. And so I looked at her and my off the cuff comment was, oh, then we should definitely log them before that happens. Uh -huh. Like if you think all of these forests yeah. are going to be destroyed, that doesn't, it doesn't make any, and that was just my off and the, the yeah. color drained from her face. I realized, oh, I just said the wrong thing. And I, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know anything about logging, but anyway, like uh, it was wild. The idea of it's like, oh, all this is going to be destroyed and there, and the, the implied thing of that, and there's nothing that we can do about it. It says it's a force of nature of which humans don't have any role anymore. Anyway, so car carry on with the history, please. Well, so that, that's a very important, and I'm going to come back to that actually. I mean, cause that's a very important series of questions that we need to be asking ourselves about how our politics work. Um, but so, Jump ahead, 1916, you have what's known as, um, the big burn raging across Yellowstone. Um, this is our, bi our big kind of first as a civilization, as, as a sort of modern American civilization, our first big mega fire, right? And um, I'm gonna get in trouble here too, actually, but I'll say this. So historically fire had been very, very much a part of American agriculture not just not just in terms of native use but also in terms of white use um and uh you know there were there were very large fires uh in the east um largely because of like logging slash which is the byproduct of logging that would sort of like end up close enough that you could have these massive fires racing through eastern woodlands even though they're more damp um and european managers just thought this was disgusting right so this was a big kind of European smart guy telling like the American yokel like get your shit together um and this is kind of an interplay that happened uh much through um colonial periods uh and into the kind of industrial modern era uh and so at the time of that big burn um we had you know recently inaugurated the forest service with one of the most respected agencies ever created in the United States government um and at that time a very very kind of gung-ho young belief in the future progressive institution um run by Gifford Pinchot not at that time but founded by Gifford Pinchot with a close friend of Teddy Roosevelt um and it was like we're gonna solve this like there, there's a solvable scientific way to do forestry um and Gifford Pinchot was trained in Germany um where they didn't have this it wasn't a part of the ecosystem and over time I'm losing the date here but over time the kind of classic, a lot of people probably heard this, 10 a.m. policy came, where the Forest Service said, from now on, our goal is fire starts, we're putting it out by 10 a.m. the next morning. And as you said, like, there's, if you want to get into a conversation about the failure of experts to figure out how to manage 
a society. Forestry is a great example because for most of the history of American forestry, the experts have been just entirely wrong about almost everything they said. Um, and they're like, the profession and academic discipline of forestry has like a huge amount to answer for over its history. Um, and you could almost make the argument that we'd been better off without it. Um, Clearing and, logs out of streams, I think that was a classic uh, forest service thing. Oh my God. And so, yeah, <laughs> anyway, this is brilliant, you know. <laughs> it goes forever. And I mean, this gets into, I mean, this gets into stuff that like, I mean, GMO fast growing, plantation trees and stuff that like like a lot I think if people knew kind of what a lot of forestry is about which is making money for the timber industry they'd be really horrified um and it's a it's a real I think it's a real indictment of the whole academic discipline um that that's changing a little bit but there's and if a you lot travel around to lumber town old lumber towns but once were lumber towns in the west they're not doing well and they haven't been doing well for a long time well, and I that's think the it, worst. And that's the worst part of it is that well-managed forests. If if the forest had been like the idea of managing a forest is not bad in itself, and if the forest had been managed well, there's no reason that those towns couldn't be doing well too. That people could be uh yeah, anyway, carry on. I actually Okay, let me finish this capsule history and I'll tell you why they can't be doing well. And okay, it's in yeah, the please. both of the industry and actually of environmentalists. Um, but there's a structural reason why they can't do well. Sure. Um, so, so basically we put this fire suppression um, regime in and the Forest Service, the Forest Service leads a coterie not, not literally leads, but they are the big partner in a coterie of agencies that manage fire across particularly the West. Um, as the Forest Service goes, goes the rest of the world. Um, and so by the mid 1970s, the argument was over. The argument about fire suppression was absolutely over. Um, and the Forest Service realized that this policy didn't work and was not healthy for forests. Um, and people who are interested in this story should read Stephen Pine's book, Between Two Fires. But basically there were these, there was this organization called uh, Tall Timbers where they would have conferences and Tall Timbers folded up sometime in the 1970s because they were like, we won the argument. Um, and you had at Boise, which is sort of the interagency meeting place. They had a interagency kind of, the BLM, the Forest Service, the Park Service, they were all got together and they realized this is a bad idea. Um, but by this point, but, we have decades of undergrowth and decades exactly. of stuff just waiting to burn. Right. That is so built up. Forest Service is bad actor one. Bad actor two is industry. And that I'm not ascribing, these are not levels of blame. It's just historically kind of how this is working. Um, bad actor two is industry who is at this time against their own interests, maybe. Depends on how you want to look at it. The in industry is kind of like, well, they're, we're persisting in clear cuts and they're still going to the Forest Service on public land and getting, you know, clear cut timber sales that are absolutely just indefensible, indefensible uh, for anyone involved. Um, At really low, they're paying way less for all this than they should too, a lot of times, but anyway. Yeah, but keep in mind, so this is actually an important part of this story for people who are interested in how this, and how this all, we all ended up with basically like people picking up guns and joining militias in places like this, is that those public lands timber sales paid for everything, every government service in these counties. Um, and so you have Josephine County, Oregon, 60% of that county is forest service, or actually, sorry, it's BLM, but it's 60% of it is forested public land and every every dime of that county government basically came from timber sales on that land now i mean in 2015 they had five police deputies to police a county of 80,000 people like the the money just disappeared right so i yes they were getting Yes, it was cheaper maybe than it would have been to go to Kamchatka and find new timber, but 
the small public lands timber sales actually like they were contributing a huge amount to American society in terms of funding things that mattered to people in rural areas. Like, and that's, that's a thing that I think a lot of people forget. Um, so to move forward in this story in a really important way. So environmentalists to the, I don't wanna take anything away from anybody in this. They really fought a lot of these timber sales and they didn't have a lot of luck until you started getting to uh, conversations about old growth. Um, and old growth trees being trees that are in forests that have never been logged before, which are increasingly rare. Um, and old growth was a concept that didn't even exist until the 80s. Like, like somebody came up with, somebody like figured out like, oh, old growth has different, di like a different kind of character as an ecosystem and forest than normal forest that I'm used to seeing. Uh, and I forget who that was, but somebody listening to this will know. Um, but oddly, old growth, has like one of the in Cascadia and the Siskiyous and areas like this, old growth is home to the Western spotted owl. Um, and so a kind of confluence events led to the spotted owl getting listed on under ESA and the Endangered Species Act. Um, and what that did was basically shut down all the public lands law. And industry had overplayed its hand um, environmentalists thought this was a huge victory. Um, the Forest Service kind of presented itself as in the middle. Um, and quietly, this is kind of the big key point that a lot of people don't understand, is like Red Emerson, who lives just down the road from me here, um, and is the head of Sierra Pacific Industries, Red Emerson had just bought all of the Southern Pacific Railroad lands um, with huge amounts of Eastern capital uh, the day after the Black Friday crash in 1989, um, because he knew that if the spotted owl got listed, all the public lands logging would be gone and he would have a monopoly. And so, uh, and we can even fast forward. I mean, people around here talk and know that Georgia Pacific cutting, um, cutting fast growth, um, fast growing softwood timber in the East they were whispering in Al Gore's ear, Tennessee Senator saying, hey, let's do this Northwest Forest Plan. Let's shut down public lands logging. What that did was it put in the hands of highly capitalized monopolistic operators in the West, um, a timber industry that had been distributed before. It had been distributed, had small mills, independent operators who were getting these leases, who were paying a lot of taxes because they were operating on public lands. And by dint of it, you had an economy that if it had persisted today would be really well equipped to do restoration work because you could pay that those people to go out and thin and do like ecologically sustainable logging. You could have these mills operating. We have no mill capacity anymore because all of our mill capacity is now run at very low wages by very highly mechanized operations through Sierra Pacific in Washington. It's wire user or whatever um, we have a tiny bit of the local stuff left out in my county okay there's some um, people but yeah i mean you're right about the macro picture I and mean, there's some guys now who have like mobile milling operations that's cool that's what i want to get into yeah that's, that I, exists I, a little bit yeah and there's some uh you know small timber cuts on private land but mm -hmm. any old growth they sell it to japan because Which they get such, even, none of that stuff stays domestically because they get such higher prices yeah. there yeah. that even with the shipping and so on. So if anyone um, has some old growth on his land and you know sells it for for timber, it's just it's just straight to Japan. Which... And my question about this to people who are involved, um, kind of people who think that the Northwest Forest Plan was a win for environmentalists. Um, and it is always, you know, there's always this argument and this was put in the judge's decision. The judge said, essentially, these aren't direct words, but he said essentially that logging communities and the logging industry is an anachronism and that it's quote, going away, right? But is American demand for wood products going away? So what is your argument? Like that, that, we're going to get rid of a local industry pulling wood from American lands 
but you're not going to address the demand side at all, there's a logical issue there. And the actual truth is that American logging didn't go away. It just moved to highly mechanized um, private operations outside of the sight of people who are on these roads, you know, going to their favorite lake. They don't see a clear cut anymore. They don't see a timber operation anymore, by and large. Um, Cause they're not up. Like, like the other day I was up on SPI land. They're still doing clear cuts up there, but nobody sees it. I had to, what I had to hike 20 miles back to see that, you know? Yeah. We see them out here. Um, like even out on the Olympic coast, uh, yeah. we see them. Um, and you know, you like go to the whole rainforest and hike around and then you drive not that far and you know, come across a, a right. clear cut. Right. And it's why, yeah, it's just, it just breaks my heart because people have just been cutting and obviously like it, it, it's ridiculous to talk about people because when you're talking about these large yeah companies that are public companies or have you know owned by investors or whatever it's not it's not even there's someone making decisions at some level but it, it it's not personal decisions in the same way that it was, once was um and those decisions those personal decisions to be clear like we're often made badly and like oh you yeah can't, like the reason we are where we are today is that like that rosy old thing of like there used to be eight mills in Happy Camp, California, and now the town is absolutely devastated. Um, those mills weren't doing what they should have done, and they got punished for like the. It's just that they got it from both sides. They got it from the environmentalists, and they got it from the industry, and it destroyed what could have been this middle ground of like actually a sustainable, local, beneficial middle class industry. And it's so much like the thing that I was trying to tell people is it's so much like the destruction of the American family farm where it's like you kind of you had these big operators come in and capitalize and tell people well that, that kind of farming was going away anyway there's no way you could keep doing that and it's like of course there was if there had been planning and if there had been an argument for it and if people hadn't been beat over the head and told oh this is such an anachronism you don't deserve this way of life this can never be sustained in this modern world of course, if we had made it a priority to sustain it, we could have done it. Um, but they made the they made the industry and the environmentalist argument for them by doing those clear cuts, by being so bad, and by essentially not knowing how good they had it. Um, so that all feeds just to put this put a cherry on this. Um, that has all fed in this region, and I would imagine I know for a fact. I mean, I was in Astoria recently, like. You can, this is very live history. This isn't even history at all. This is, this is stuff that people talk about all the time. Um, and it's similar across the West. It's just, this is the area where it's most salient in part too, because we don't really have that many spotted owls here. Um, and so the outsized political impact of this particular thing um, and the ability that people in this region have to put a name to it, uh, without even really kind of having been at the epicenter of where this ecology, the, the, the ecological problem that it was supposed to solve even is, it just has fed such anger. And it really contributed to a huge amount of feeling that this is not a part of California. This is a different region. Um, and after COVID, which contributed to that as well, because we didn't shut down up here, um, I don't know that that's ever coming back. Uh, it almost feels weird to see California plates on on cars here. It just doesn't feel like that place anymore. Um, and that that's a little bit, it comes and goes, but that's a little bit kind of a new feeling. Yeah, it's interesting. I live in a place that in some ways is, um, I don't know, it's not even a holdout. It's just be the geography of the place ensures this. But my county, Whatcom County, and below us, Skagit County, it's all small farms. Right. All of it. And it's fascinating because it's so, it's, I don't know what other counties in the US or this is the case. It's hard to find, like, you know, Amish, places that are real heavily Amish. So Amish are what, 80, 100 acre farms usually. Um, and even a 100 acre farm seems, would seem large here, maybe. Um, 
but you know the place like oh. Whatcom County a lot of it was settled by Dutch dairy farmers but uh, it makes me want to investigate more the logging that happens out here because it definitely happens I, I see it <laughs> uh, and who's doing it because it's not um, around Mount Baker is federal land I believe but it's not most of this county is not you know we don't have all the um, federal public land the same way so I think it's logging on private land mostly um anyway that'll be for th something for me to investigate because i know that there are a few smaller milling mobile milling and even not mobile um and you know we have a lot of great we have great cedar up here uh yeah not as good as it once was but it's all you know it, there, there was a time when people basically salmon and cedar formed a complete way of yeah. life Absolutely. Uh, they, everything uh, almost salmon and cedar and salmon and cedar of course as you know are really connected to one another yeah because salmon bringing up all the nutrients from the ocean um, yeah. uh, <clears throat> okay so now um, this is the doomer optimism podcast but with the forest having been mismanaged for so long are we simply doomed or is it is it going to take people's just renegades uh, starting fires? <laughs> I'm not I'm not advocating people go out and intentionally start fires at all. But I'm just like, is there a path yeah. forward here? Well, so let me circle back to the Great Basin because I want people to understand too. Like, sorry, that sounded too cocky. I didn't mean it that way. But my experience, my experience doing this stuff is the problem is that you can't actually anymore just rely on the fire to do what it historically did right so in the great basin um you have sagebrush on historical 35 45 year fire cycles it hasn't burned for 100 years when that happens you're burning down to mineral soil and the first thing that comes back in southern idaho where i work a lot um the first thing that's going to come back is the cheat the what they ranchers in the Great Basin, you know, they've always called noxious weeds, which is a euphemism for stuff that basically they brought. Um, and once that comes in, you can't, that you can do aerial seeding, you can get your helicopters and your planes and stuff, you can drop seeds out. It's not coming back. Um, and so that's why, like, to put, a, to put a dark spin on this first, before I get to the optimism, you know, like the sage grouse, we talk all the time about the sage grouse and we talk all the time about how it's such an important indicator species for huge portions of the American West, from Wyoming to Eastern Washington. I mean, from the, I don't know how far south it goes, but just literally like a huge portion of the American landmass. Like you can basically gauge the health of it by whether or not sage grouse are doing okay. And like, realistically, like we still might lose this. We, it, it just might be a fight that we're losing. And there's huge numbers of biologists and restoration workers who are doing everything they can to save it. Um, and the reason for that is actually that you can't, once you excluded fire for this long, when they come, they're so big and they're so devastating that all the benefits that we used to get from them are, have turned into basically the opposite. Um, and that is going to be true of our forests as well. Um, you can't, honestly expect to have these high density forests i mean people i mean go to the mendocino national forest it is crazy it is crazy it looks like a box of fireworks um and you can't have these forests burn because they will burn through the crowns and this happened just down the road for me they burn through the crowns of these trees at that high intensity and the forests don't come back um so Okay. The fires are too hot. The fires are too hot and they're burning instead of along the ground, replenishing things, creating nutrients at the bottom, stuff like that. They're burning through the canopies and just killing them. They're burning all the greenery. Um, and they're racing along the top so fast that, first of all, I mean, forget cutting fire line. You, you, your fire is burning 50 feet up. You cut fire line all you want. You can't even control that fire, you know? So that's what, and then you have a town coming up. You've got, you know, 3,000 guys. I don't care who you have there. I don't care if you're dropping retardant, you have a tank or anything. You're not stopping that fire as it heads into town. Either you've evacuated that town or people are going to die. 
that's the realistic thing. I mean, and that's the problem is that we've gotten to a point where it's so difficult to manage these fires at these, to say nothing of, I mean, frankly, I've been on these fires, to say nothing of when it's 112 degrees outside. Like you, you, you just can't, your operational ability at that point is not very high. Um, you have to kind of just let them do their thing because your guys can't do it and women. Um, okay, so that was, a, that was a dark picture. Uh, the bright picture I have is that um, I encourage people to listen to my friend Hal Herring's podcast. He talks a lot about this. Um, but like people have kind of figured out that the historical politics of this stuff didn't really work out for anybody. Um, and I think anybody, I mean, I like I said, I talked to a lot of people in the Forest Service and I think they're very well aware that there's a certain tendency in the American environmental movement that has gone absolutely disconnected from reality. And I'm sorry, I mean, I, I still call myself an environmentalist, but that politics, that kind of oppositional politics and like the other side is bad, like that has cost us and it is gonna cost us more um, and it's not working. And I think people have figured that out. I think people have really figured out, hey, like if we could do some of this restoration work at scale, people could make a lot of money. Um, so like for us, like I planted, not personally, but my crew planted 150,000 sagebrush in Southern Idaho um, last year um, in October. We have very good survival rates. We pay people really well. We pay people 50 cents a plant, 55 cents a plant. You're making, I made nine, like 10,000 bucks working hard, you know, people are buying trucks, people are buying their elk gun, people are paying for their winter off of that. And I don't see any reason why you couldn't keep doing that. And that's where it's gonna go is it, people really working with their hands, people getting out in the woods doing a small scale logging. Um, I think the forest service, I think every single person who's at a serious level in the forest service is aware of what we need to do and that it's gonna involve a lot of just humans with chainsaws and a lot of humans with rakes and a lot of humans set with drip torches to setting fires. I think people have figured this out. I just don't think we have the political conversations yet to get there. Um, and that, that would bridge a, a lot of these gaps, right? Yeah. I mean, the people in a lot of these places who need work, mm -hmm. they need work and who have, you know, are tied to the land want to do real work in it yeah uh and want to get paid for provide for their families um yeah i worked briefly for um i don't want to speak ill of them I mean, they were very nice to me but a small you know an environmental nonprofit. um when i was in grad school and uh what became very clear to me was that a, they did not understand this this is not how they understood themselves but it was very yeah. clear to me that they were effectively an industry lobbying group for the sustainable, quote unquote, sustainable in yep. energy industry, which yep. effectively, if you look at who actually builds that stuff, yeah, it's like turbines built by uh, German, was the Siemens, like the large German corporation and so on. Like that's who the actual industry is, not to mention whatever Chinese companies build the um solar panels but uh but that's what effectively the group was doing uh, and they didn't understand the fact that they didn't understand that about themselves was interesting because i think all the people involved were you know really kind people who if you ask them how they ended up doing the work they were doing mm -hmm. would have lovely stories yeah about growing up in maryland and you know wanting to uh preserve the bay and so on yeah. and so forth uh and then when you look at what they were asking for it's like well is building a lot of wind turbines out in the bay like what does that yeah. do but anyway uh I mean, sorry to cut you but so one way of looking at this that i think is is a real i mean i live i like i live in shasta county like like I, so i'm comfortable talking about stuff in a kind of stark way like like people get like, like the, 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 the distance between environmental activism 
and the Mongols biker gang, like knocking on someone's door, it's only a couple steps here, you know? So like, I'm a little like kind of pretty stark about some of this stuff, but like people got destroyed. Like this county, a lot of people in this county got destroyed by basically a, a political conflict that had nothing to do with them and it did not have good outcomes either for the people or for the ecosystems um and as things get worse here both ecologically and in terms of especially kind of financial colonization of second homers who have made it impossible for people of our generation to live and build futures here like stuff is going to get really 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 scary um, and it is already getting really scary here. Um, and I, I don't think anybody who lives here would deny that. What, whatever and by scary, you mean the potential for political violence. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for people who don't know, um, you should check out my Harper's piece, haha. Uh, but like the militia runs- But the not even haha, you should. It's a very, very interesting. Um, sorry, my dog just barked. Um, bitch. Sorry. No, he, he agrees that everyone should read your Harper's piece. Yes, yes, he very much agrees. He was there for all the reporting of it, too. Um, yeah, I mean, I got attacked reporting it, you know? Um, and now the militia, like, I went out for dinner last night, two nights ago, with my girlfriend in a kind of pretty right-wing town. Um, and there were, like, militia people being like, man, if anybody says anything to you, like, you just tell us we're going to get, like, you know, it's that kind of thing here. So did bit. those guys like your article? <laughs> I don't want to say. Um, they did in the same I, way. Because I thought like, that, I mean, it was similar to your Bundy book. You know, you weren't, you were critical where you disagreed, but, you know, you were sympathetic to the basic human impulses underlying this stuff. That the, you know, a lot of the grievances were real. The <clears throat> Yeah. And they understood that um the long story short they did like my articles um i it's funny because it's a rorschach test like like a lot of the sort of like local npr listening set really loved the article too and we called it you know i heard the word chilling a lot uh and people were they thought it was like a real expose of like a, a group of you know basically evil people um, and what is weird about doing journalism today is you can just let people speak for themselves and you're going to have reads that come from right and left that are entirely, like they, that seem entirely incompatible. Um, and yet somehow both right and left can really love the article because they feel like it was, well, right feels like it was a fair de depiction and left feels like when they hear right wing people talking, it's so crazy that you've really like showed something um, evil of the lurking to overthrow the American Republic. Um, and I've learned essentially that I'm not a political actor. I just let people talk for themselves and it works pretty well as a mode for doing journalism today. Um, but it's, I mean, one of the sad things that you capture in your writing is that these conflicts, conflicts whether in the Great Basin or in Northern California are very, very local and very, very personal. Mm -hmm. But they get swept up into these national forces and national conversations that make um, what could otherwise be kind of uh, interesting into a local reenactment of the same stupid thing. So you have a couple moments in the in your chosen country book. Where you're having you're hanging out with these guys at these occupations you know defending a miner who's going um in conflict with the bureau of land management uh and by the way i it was wild to me i had no idea there were guys in trailers doing that kind of small-scale mining uh still uh and i guess there aren't that many of them but what uh, the like those guys just must be the toughest craziest guys in the country i mean the your description of the mind of the mine <laughs> that they were saying to defend was um like the scariest thing in the whole <laughs> like the idea of guys <laughs> climbing into those holes was the scariest thing in the whole piece but um that in these conversations that there was a moment 
and all these things when you describe it as kind of almost politically ecumenical mm-hmm. when things mm-hmm. are up in the air and things are weird and local and there are a lot of different personalities and it's kind of interesting it seems like that there are there's a way that that there was a, a possibility that things could have gone in any number of directions some of them sort of interesting and by the end of it it becomes more and more hardened and less and less interesting um mm-hmm. and uh and more and more tied into these kind of national uh political things yeah. and media political things which honestly i think the closer you are to those i think it just makes everyone insane actually like they they're it's they serve as sort of vectors of insanity um or people who get people get wrapped up in that stuff anyway they lose their minds and so um anyway it, uh, i'm rambling now but it seems like both in northern the stuff in northern california maybe there's still a possibility there and some of the these fights around land in the Great Basin, that there were glimmers of possibility of oh of of t- thinking and acting in a totally different way that breaks with um, some of that stuff. But then, unfortunately, as time wore on, and I think in the case of the Great Basin stuff, this was probably intentionally pushed in that direction by uh, federal law enforcement. Um, it got less interesting and more hardened. Um, anyway. So, okay. So I'm about to go full doom or optimism here. Yeah, um, please. Okay. So you will notice that if you really, to quote, I mean, to, or like to borrow a concept from Paul Kingsnorth, right? Like the, the people who I'm interested in are these kind of people who are caught in political conversations, but whose personal local interests are resisting a wider sort of machine right and so it's like you have a group of people who just kind of want to do the mining and don't really understand why they can't live in a cabin out on blm land still and do the mining but then they kind of like suddenly you pick up the phone you call the militia and it's like bam now you have a right left political valence and now the enviros and the liberals hate you. And essentially, I, as a journalist, have difficulty speaking in your interest because you've called the militia, you've adopted this kind of right-wing valence, and now it's war. And that's kind of this, the, the sad, like kind of mediatized political tragedy of these times. The Bundys are the same way. I don't know how many people know this, but the reason that the Bundy family is what it is, is that uh, in, I'm not going to say a year because I might get it wrong, but when the desert tortoise was listed under ESA uh, uh, to be endangered, um, fish and wildlife had to preserve, you have to preserve the desert tortoise, right? And what's going to hurt in Southern Nevada, the desert tortoise? Well, the biggest thing is swimming pools and the expansion of Las Vegas into previously pristine Mojave Desert. Well, Fish and Wildlife didn't want to mess with that. So they took 55 ranchers in Southern Clark County and agreed, they made an agreement. They were going to get rid of them. And that was going to be mitigation to prevent basically Las Vegas from having to stop expanding infinitely and engaging in its hyper-capitalist kind of death spiral that it's in now. Um, And so okay, fine, you don't like Cliven Bundy. He's a big, bad right-wing guy. But Cliven saw what that game was. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. Everybody else can sell out. Everybody else can get run off of here. But I'm going to stay. And I don't agree with Cliven about a lot of stuff. But that's an interesting kind of complicated wrinkle on American life that he was able to raise. Um, And it's not all about I'm a right-wing militia bad guy, right? And so that's the murkiness that I like to operate in. And the reason I bring that up is because um, let me put it this way. It used to be a few years ago that I felt like there's a lot of, there are usually guys who look, talk, think a lot like me 
they drive Toyotas and they shoot guns, but they care about the environment and they drive around. And to some degree, this kind of shapes the, the cultural conversation around ecology in the West. I mean, because we write about it and do all that stuff. Um, and it wasn't that long ago that I felt like everybody like me was very much caught up in a vortex of everything is this kind of left right existential struggle instead of what I thought really shaped most of our vision, which is this kind of pushback against the machine. Um, so just to pause, and I've just noticed that change briefly. All the anger is directed, all the environmental left wing anger is directed at the Bundys. Meanwhile, the developers in Las Vegas. Yep are building more subdivisions yeah. and swimming pools in the desert uh and and all of that anger and attention is focused on you know a family of ranchers who are just happen mm -hmm. to be in the the crosshairs mm -hmm. of um federal land management and that was deliberate that was a deliberate construction by i mean the Center for Biological Diversity. Like they did that on purpose. Um, and I'm, I don't even say that to take away from them. They did that because making an enemy was gonna work out well for them. Um, and they constructed Cliven as an enemy. I don't think, I don't even think they would disagree with that. Um, and unfortunately for them, I hate to say it, but they lost the fight. Like that's what's wild about it is they constructed Cliven as an enemy and then he beat them. Um, so that's a kind of wild thing to kind of have to process. but. The reason I say this is because I highly encourage people who listen to this to pick up a copy of High Country News, which used to be the great kind of organ of cranky, enviro, lefty-ish um, worldviews in the West. I mean, what you might call like, like people call it like the forerunner enviro thing, forerunner being the Toyota forerunner, um, like that kind of worldview. Um, and now it's just pure culture war. Um, and you know, I used to dream of writing for High Country News and it's like, now it's a, like, what is going on here? Um, and, you know, behind the scenes, like obviously there's been a lot of upheaval from that because a lot of people involved in that magazine have been like, why are you just doing culture war all of a sudden? Um, and I say that, I mean, that sounds like a grim picture, but I say that because I think a lot of people have just realized like, oh, these left, right kind of valences that we attach to these conversations are no longer functioning. Um, and a lot of these divisions, a lot of these old hatreds, these kind of tribal hatreds, enviro versus rancher, like it's not gonna work. Um, and I think a lot of people are starting to realize that, hey, like, first of all, we're probably gonna lose the fight, at least here, we're gonna, like the climate change thing is kind of a done deal. Like we, our climate has already begun to change here to the degree that there's gonna be catastrophe no matter what happens on a global policy level. Um, and so what do you do, right? Are you gonna, are you gonna have like a big war over whether we have more wind turbines here? It doesn't matter. Um, you can, however, build resilience. Um, you can, however, like look across these boundaries and talk to ranchers, talk to loggers, talk to these people and build stuff that might last through it. Um, and it's and interesting the conversation with the logger I had when I he was wearing a sweatshirt is yeah. what tipped me off. And so I started talking, I was like, oh, you know, do you work in the industry? And at first he was very guarded. Yeah. Yeah. Until I was in until I kind of said a few things or asked questions. And like, no, I'm actually really interested in what you're doing. And I don't, you know, anyway. Uh, but there's this even yeah, there and the, the I don't even think he was wrong to be guarded, actually. No. In no, the right. like in the you know the um at that particular park, you know, in my neighborhood, it probably was reasonable for him to be a little hesitant. Um, yeah. but then he was overjoyed to you know chat and it was I mean the fact that he had such deep long family history in the region it was really interesting and it was also, you know, he was really sad. Like he's been able to continue making a living. And it sounds like his family does very well living a kind of idyllic rural yeah. Northwest life. Yeah. But he was like, yeah, if, you know, 
couple generations back they hadn't been so greedy and dumb you know we'd been really we'd be really doing well now yeah i think he's right about that although i think he's i think in so much as if you're gonna have basically like an endless cycle of mechanization and capitalization running through every part of human life for the until the end of history there's no decision he could have made that could have saved that right and like sure. And and that's what we see here. I mean, especially because Northern California is so regulatory difficult to operate that there's only basically one timber company up here. It's SPI. And it's a it is a complete monopoly. And Red Emerson is God up here. Um, and people revere him. What's funny is people don't even people don't even blame him for what happened, which is. I don't know, we could get into that a little more, um, but the thing the thing that that speaks to to me is a little bit like it is important for people to remember that like i mean liberals and like leftists kind of like hate admitting this but like the cultural power that i possess here is very high and like it is a kind of thing where it's like i can go into a logger bar and be a journalist and affect the way I affect and dress the way I dress. And I wield cultural power. Whereas the logger guy goes into the bar where like guys like me hang out and he feels off base, he feels nervous. And to me, like, the reason I bring that up is because like, there's such a swamping effect right now in the West of people who are coming from the outside and moving into these places. And it does have an ecological effect. It has an ecological effect on the carrying capacity of the population increases. Um, it has an effect in terms of like how the communities interact with the land because they're less stable. I mean, people do illegal weed grows, start fires, steal tree burls, uh, do illegal um, firewood cutting because they're desperate because they can't afford to literally like live in the West anymore. And so you're going to buy hook or buy crook, do it. Cause where are you going to go? You're going to move to Alabama now. Like these guys don't know how to do that. Um, so there's that. And then there's also like, um, there's a good, I think it was the guardian piece. I'm trying to think where it was about how like a lot of towns are just less resilient to fire than they used to be because people don't have the local knowledge. Cause you have all these people who like, moved here from the bay a little bit ago and just figure the fire department's going to take care of their house and it's just not happening um and so like i don't know again like my optimism is just based on the fact that our back is against the wall a little bit and like if we don't revert to some kind of localism and some kind of kind of softening of the term softening of these tribal political conflicts like we're just really not going to be able to do the stuff we need to do to get through this um and when i say this i mean it's already here like it's gonna it's 116 118 120 here at 2000 feet um you know at roughly the parallel of boston like you're you can't survive in a forested landscape without taking some pretty serious steps at that point um and i don't know if we're gonna get there but i think some communities are throughout the west and i see that a lot um i see that more in the interior west than here but i think it it may come and if it doesn't everything just burns well it burns but your society falls apart too um i think i mean you you have roving bands of there are places in this region where that's already true you just have roving bands of people who are in charge um and you know the bikers come back there's whole sections of siskiyou county that are run basically by Chinese Tong gangs that are just fully illegal weed grows. And it's post, post apocalyptic because you have, they don't have any water. You have 5,000 people in Mount Shasta Vista, uh, which is a subdivision um, outside of weed. 5,000 people who've moved there basically in the last 10 years, which is accounts for almost like a third to a quarter of the county. Um, and they don't have any water at all. So they bring in trucks of water from the ranchers who are pulling from what otherwise would have been there, like alfalfa water, or, you know, feed water, whatever. Um, and the cops have banned that because weed growing is illegal in Siskiyou County. 
but they don't have, there's not enough state capacity. There's not enough cops. There's not enough stuff to actually prevent those water trucks from getting in. And so when you go in those areas, I mean, there's guys with spotting scopes who are following you. There's dogs, there's gates. Um, like there's a lot of stuff to talk about with that area. And I don't even want to start really getting into it, but like, that's just a place where the state kind of doesn't work anymore. Um, and you and I both having been anarchists, like there's a part of that that's like, great. But there's a part of it where you look and you just think like, oh, this is just a, a portion of our county here where like society is broken down and there's really nothing anybody can do. And it has everything to do with ecology. Um, a fire went through there last year, um, the lava fire, and a guy got killed by the cops after they tried to, to um, cordon it off. Uh, and that set off just basically like a, a political conflict that consumed county government here. Um, and a lot of people are getting sued. The county may have to go under injunction. That's just not gonna work in the future. Um, and so people are either gonna tone it back and tone back some of this boundless faith in capital to solve human problems, or we're just gonna live in endless chaos. I don't, I don't think it's gonna be as pretty as it all burning to death. I think it's gonna be just degraded unhappy chaos so there um something that i've noticed in the last couple of years is much more pronounced that i haven't seen many people talking about as i don't know if this exists where you are but where i am there are all of these sort of diy mad max vehicle homes yeah the people have built um some of them are frankly terrifying and not road safe at all but some of them are kind of ingenious i see some of them and i'm like wow that was actually that was clearly a diy build and it was awesome i mean some of these are really well done some of them are horrifying you get everything in between so there's talk sometimes of like the van life thing yeah which i've known some people have done who are kind of you know professionals who did the van life thing but this is a totally different thing the people involved are not the van life crew I don't know who they are or where they're going, or where they're going or how they make a living, but I, I assume there's the similar vibe in Northern California. And I'm curious what your read on that is, because it feels very much like that for those people, collapse has already happened. Yeah. And that yeah. they're now, and they're living a sort of itinerant, quasi legal. I, I don't know how you register some of these vehicles. I assume a lot of them are just not registered or were registered before they made their crazy builds uh, on them. Uh, so I'm curious what your read on that is. Well, um, so this is California police state, you know, so it's a little difficult. Um, like it, it's more difficult here than it is other places to get that vehicle registered. Um, I, which I think perhaps why the biggest kind of homeless camp around here is actually in Medford, Oregon across the border. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, that's what, I guess that's kind of where I was getting to with this is like, so by the time you get to summer here, it already starts to feel post-apocalyptic um, in certain ways. Like it, it starts to feel post-collapse. Um, and like, I, I don't think you can emphasize enough how much the high rents here, like I pay more to live, I'm in a single wide right now. Uh, I'm in a single wide in the trailer park right by the highway. I pay more to live here than I did to pay in LA um, because so many people from the Bay have come up and bought second homes. Um, and that's not speculation. I have talked to the mayor of this town. They have done studies. The reason why that happened was because of second homers from the Bay. Like th there's evidence for that. Um, and I say that because um, that is social control. That is, that is actual, it is, it is social control and it's not a great mechanism for it because like the guy who fixes the small engines, the woman, the, the, the lesbian couple that does like the wood selling and like sells out of the back of the truck and like lives in this one place at 300 bucks and they put a tent there for the kid. Like that kind of like weird semi-itinerant, but like stable, you still get people to school, you still make it happen. That kind of lifestyle that was very much a part of life up here for many, many years. Um, you can't do if you're spending $1,700, $1,800 a month for rent. Um, and you can't do it if you have to get a credit check. You can't do it if 
you know, they won't rent to a felon. So all that stuff is out the window. And those people are into trailers. Those people are into tents. Um, and to talk about real, real, real crazy post-apocalyptic ecology and economics coming together, um, I just did fire training because uh, I didn't, I kind of like know all the stuff about fire, but I didn't have my certs. So I had to go to fire school, which is an absolute insane joke. Um, but I had, you know, you have to do it. And, you know, you do a 20 question test on fire behavior that they allowed people to self grade. <laughs> um, so like they're not learning anything uh, and they get $15 an hour. Uh, I looked at my phone as we're talking, people who I was in a class with who knew nothing about fire 10 days ago are already in the truck headed to Arizona right now. Um, and I counted of the 12 people I took the class with, four lived in tents um, and two lived in trailers and one lived in a garage. And those are just the people I know where they live. That, there may be some people who have a house and an apartment, I don't know, but as far as the people in that class who I knew where they lived, I wrote in my notebook that not a single one had a regular living situation. And those are the people that were shoving out as bodies 10 days after they sign up for a course to go stand in 105, 106 degree fire with no physical training. Um, like it just feels like all of these things coming together in such a grim way where you have this kind of disposable class of forgotten humans who will take these jobs and frankly we're desperate for them like people were like if i don't pass this test i don't know what i'm going to do they're getting shoved out as bodies and you know like the, they're pretty good these the people who do these incidents are pretty good at keeping people alive like that's the kind of weird part is that it they're good at keeping people alive so that they can have them working for 15 dollars an hour not making any money, not getting ahead, living out of trailers, living out of tents, living in the back of their car as they do sometimes 20 hour days. You know, it just. So your it, vision is to ha hire up all those people and have them making more money planting sagebrush that and would be good. local plants uh, and doing controlled burns controlled so that you don't need to send uh people to you know survive trying to do something to fight fires well and this gets to the problem right is like so think of, i mean like probably a lot of people listening to this are aware just from like following npr like how skewed the forest service budget is towards firefighting right and how skewed frankly i mean california uh you know we spend a lot of money like on cal fire here like if you took that money and there's always these attempts, there's always these conversations, there's always this desire to kind of shift away from fire suppression towards fire prevention, towards restoration, towards ecosystem management. And that never happens, right? And um, the reason that doesn't happen is because there is this, there is this kind of right left paradigm where it's just, if the environs want it, then it's bad. And then flip side is like, if, some logger or you know if some i mean people people that guy chad hansen who's the biggest fucking idiot in the world um sorry that's my one unkind i will try to restrain that but he wrote this book talking about how thinning was environmental hate speech and you're like you're trying to think like if this is where you're going with this if, if you're talking about people who are interested in good faith and trying to find solutions to these problems, and then you're saying that they're engaged in environmental hate speech, then like, what, where do you think this is all going to lead? Like, do you think you're going to win that fight? You think you're going to get people on your side, enough people on your side that they're all going to scream environmental hate speech enough, they're going to get rid of all the bad guys, and then you're going to be able to do whatever stuff you want to do. Do you really think that's going to work? Because I don't. And to me, like, there has to be, I don't look at it as a laying down of arms. I do look at it as a real conversation about not just let's get together. They always do this with the sage grouse. They do this all the time with the sage grouse. Let's all get in a room. We're going to make a plan. Good. Okay, great. You're going to do a countywide plan. You're going to do, that's great. I love that stuff. That's good. 
But there has to be actually like a whole of government approach. There has to be like a whole kind of revamp of how we do this, how we deploy resources at large scale. And that's going to take depoliticizing, not like, hey, we got the two sides in the room and we negotiated. It's going to be, we are all on the same side. And the left has to look at itself as much as the right and just be like, why have we not been able to do that? Um, and I'm very, I'm very critical of both of them. Um, and I think politically, to be honest, there is a large constituency in this country of people who think, who are small C conservative, not in terms of how they view abortion, but how they view how they interact with the ecosystem and their community and the scale of our society at this globalized moment. And I think that the way forward is gonna to be to try to access that as a political as a political vehicle and to say like, hey, are you left wing? I don't care. Hey, are you right wing? I don't care. Don't you think it would be nice if we as a local community have more control over how this was happening? And like, don't you think it would be nice if we did some of these things to restore stuff? That's the only way to get forward. I don't know if that's possible in the American system, but if we don't, there is no environmentalism anyway, so it doesn't matter. All right, that's a perfect place to end. So thank you so much, James, uh, for joining me on Doomer Optimism. Uh, and everyone, go read his book, uh, Chosen Country, A Rebellion in the West, which, as I said before, is nominally about the Bundy occupation. And it says a lot about that. But it's, it's really uh, an interesting history of the Great Basin and about James's own uh, f attempt to find himself as a young man. Uh, and I think taps into a lot of uh, generational um, issues that uh, I resonated with a lot. So thanks. Thanks so much, James. Hey, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed this.